going to skip a rock, as I shared with you before, because you know that if I, in fact, my wife asked me what I was going to do after lunch today. She says, are you going to go home and study? And I said, no, I can't do that. Because every time I look at this thing again, I find some more stuff, you know? <laughs> and so <laughs> I can't cover what I've already written, so why should I give us some more? Verse three, are you ready? Again, the only reason you got my notes is because I want you to have them. I'm gonna read them, because that's what people do with their notes, all right? And I wrote this, the first time I wrote chapter one was in King James Version, and uh, this one I wrote in the New International Version. So, and it's all the chapters. Let's start with giving thanks in verse 3. And the text says, I thank God, my God every time I remember you. Now, I'm, I tried to share with you the other evening, last Sunday evening, uh, that uh, there's an outline, and I talked about diagramming sentences. Remember that? So I'm going to kind of make it a little easier and simpler. What you want to look at in this verse Verse 3 is thank. I thank. See, there's a thought. Then the question you ask is who does he thank? He thanks God. So you might want to just underline these things. And then we get to the, to the verse that where it says every time. And then you say what's next? Every time I remember you. There, for those of you who are not aware of it, there's what's called a quick scan Bible out there. What it does is it takes the important words and highlights them, makes them bold. You take this Bible that's called quick scan and you read it, and it says, Thank God for you every time. And all they've done was highlight the, the verse in the right places. So let's do it. So he says, Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. The next thing down you see is he's talking to, to God in behalf of the people at Philippi. And what he's doing is, is he's talking to God for what purpose? It's right there in your notes. He's the, he's the source of everything. Is that what it says? Okay, that's why you go to God, because he's got the answers. He knows what he needs to do for us. And then the next thing down that you see, number two, if, you, if you're going to thank God for something, you're going to thank God as often as possible. And I said Christians should learn to thank God for everything. And you all agree with that, don't you? Absolutely. And... Then what I want you to notice is that the more one gives thanks, what else is the rest of that? The more one wants to give thanks. Have you ever noticed that when you get started thanking God for all what all he's done, that the list gets bigger and bigger and bigger? Y'all have done this, haven't you? Thank God for something. Okay, good. So he's giving thanks to God. It's in remembrance. He's remembering them. Now, y'all remember that he's actually, he, he has in his mind who he's writing to. He's writing to Lydia, right? Y'all remember Lydia? Lydia was, was the seller of purple. He met her and her friends on the, in the water, washing the cloths. He's writing to the slave girl that, that uh, that he drove the demons out of and got beat up for and got thrown in jail, Acts 16. You all with me? And he's writing to, uh, to uh, those that had come to visit him while he was all in prison, those kinds of things. So he's actually, when you sit down to write a letter to somebody, you've got them in mind. You can actually kind of visualize them as you write dear whatever. And so Paul is saying to them, I, in, that he's praying for them. So in remembrance, Paul thanked God for 
the saints at Philippi. We covered saints last Sunday. And he thought about them, and so then he prayed about them. Notice this book is different. I told you it's a rare book. Remember me telling you it was rare? Uh, there's no bad stuff in it. There's no theology stuff in it. You got a couple of women fighting each other, and that's the reason Paul decided he needed to mention it. And he does it later in the book. He names names. And so what he's saying here is, is that the remembrances were favorable. I remember you with joy, is what he's trying to share with them. And Paul, of course, is giving thanksgiving. Let me find my scripture references. You see one there? It's called uh, Ephesians and it, 5.20. And that is always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're looking at the second thing I have there. We should likewise give thanks. What's it say? Always, Always for Always. all things. Now, did preacher, you really mean that? Yeah, all the little stuff too. If you don't get in the habit of praising God for the little stuff, how can you ever praise him for the big stuff? So, let's do verse 4. I'm going to break my record tonight, more than two verses. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Now, I wanted to let that you know he's probably a southerner. Because I translate that a little different than the Bible scholars did. It, and what he said is, y'all... I, I thank God for y'all all the time, all the time. Y'all understand what I just said? And so, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. So in joy, Paul knew he could pray to the Lord. That'll give us joy for a start, won't it? We know we can reach the throne of God. Incredible as it may seem, we should have joy in that. There are religions today, which the preacher's talking about over there. Their religious leaders are dead. How do you pray to Buddha when he's in the grave? Because, hey, he's not going to answer from there, I don't think. But see, i got a risen Savior and a Father that loves me. And the result is, I can go to him anytime I want to. And so, Paul says he could pray to the Lord. He knew he could pray for the saints. Y'all know you can pray for me, don't you? You should have. Pray that he gets done when he's supposed to, because I don't want to stay here too late tonight. Pray that he quits like he did last week. He, he, uh, he had, he had, he had been given Christ's example of prayer. If the one thing the early church learned from our Lord Jesus Christ, they learned about prayer. Remember when, when, when uh, some of John's disciples went to Jesus and said, you know, we used to hang around with that other fellow, but then he lost his head. You all know what I'm talking about? Okay. And then he said, they said, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. It, we always got to have what everybody else has got, don't we? So, and that's the way it works out. And so, uh, Paul was familiar with this prayer thing in the early church. Let me take this off. I don't think anybody's going to call me. Remember when I was preaching up here and I let my phone rang? <laughs> hey, you don't remember that? I do. I answered it. I said, hello, and I said, it's for you. It's God calling you. <laughs> I don't know whether it's going to go off or not. Neither do you know whether yours are going off. So. All right. 
Uh, we're in an asking part. He was praying on their behalf. He prayed for them joyfully. And we should pray for one another. The part that I wrote down there next under C, you see it? He prays expecting. Do you pray expecting? My mother read a book one time years and years ago. And the book was basically thanking after you ask for what you want. You all remember that? It circulated 20, 30 years ago. And the idea was is that if you really believe that he's the kind of God who gives you what you need, and you pray for what you have to have, you might as well thank him. Because he's going to give it to you. You know, when you go through that whole thing, would you give him a rock or a snake or whatever and things like that? No. So you can expect your Heavenly Father to give you the answer that you, you're expecting. And so the whole book was written about, go ahead and say thanks. You're going to get it. That's the way Paul wrote to them in terms of joy. Thanking them. When he, when he pr prayed for them, he made a request for them. And what we need to notice is, is that he did this expecting that God was going to answer the prayers. And we are expected to make requests for others. Y'all know about that, don't you? I must be from South too. Did you hear what I just did? Yeah. <laughs> Grew up in St. Louis. South St. Louis, if that counts. <laughs> Verse 5. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So, we're looking at the gospel. Um, the gospel was part of their fellowship together. The fact is, is that their whole... Wow, did you see that? I caught you. You're looking up there. Thank you. That's, that's my partner in crime up there. All right. So because of, of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, I'm going to talk about the first day until now um, and things like that. There are some parts in this book that I've got to hit and get deep on, so I'm going to share that with you somewhere in all of this. But let's just get, get, go hit the high spots tonight. The gospel was part of their fellowship. I was going to tell you, it was all about their fellowship. Without the gospel, they would not have been together to start with. It was that central force of Jesus Christ in the core of their life that even brought them together to start with. And you have to remember that this, not, this, is, a, this is a mixed group. This is everybody that just happened to be thrown into that particular area by the Roman government. You all know how they did that, right? They conquered this people over here, and this people over here, and this over here, and they grabbed a few from here, and they put them here, a few from over here, and put them there. And you got a mixed bag. And they did that because if you're not still this one group, you don't have to worry about them anymore because they've been separated. And so they sent some to some places, some to the other places. Pretty cool, huh? Except every time they did that with Christians, they started a new thing. It got good. He's got it all worked out. And remember in 70 AD when they had the dispersion? Remember when, 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 when it was all leveled and everybody had to leave town? They all went wherever they wanted to go, where they could go. You know what they did with that? They took it into the world. See, God knows what he's doing, even with the overthrow of Jerusalem and the destruction of all the temple and all that stuff. Okay, so, I'm in doing fellowship. They fellowship together. The gospel around is what they fellowshiped around. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. It says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Now that's going to confuse some of you, so let me quickly clarify it. If you believed in vain, you weren't saved. Simple as that. And so if you're going to be uh, confused over it, 
uh, and you wonder why you can can hold firmly the word I preach. If you get gloriously saved like you're supposed to do, the word holds you. And that's just my personal opinion. Because if you had to hold firm, that's works. Got it? Okay. Now you can disagree with me, but you got a right to be wrong. All right. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. And what did he receive? You don't have this text up there, man. You, you get me. Well, what's happening up there? All right. I want you to see, for what I received, I passed on to you of first importance. That Christ died for our sins. And this is important. Listen to what the rest of this text says. According to the Scriptures. The Bible told us hundreds of years before. This is going to happen. And it's going to happen this way. And it happened exactly the way the prophecies of 400 years or 600 years proclaimed it would. And so when Paul says... And that was the basis of his apologetics. Paul would tell these people it happened just like it said in Isaiah, in the books of the law, in this. In, and he was quoting Old Testament. And he would say, this is what, they, what God said he would do. Look, he did it. And that was the way that Paul would operate in terms of of trying to win the folks to the, to, to the Lord. How did they preach back then? It was really simple. You've been expecting the Messiah. Let me tell you. He's here. Just like it said, He was coming. He came. Remember what they said about Him in the book of Isaiah? Paul would tell him. It said that he was going to be crucified. He was crucified. Remember what it said over there? He's going to be raised from the dead, Paul said. He's alive. Amen. See how it works? And so when you look at all this, let me go on. Well, I guess I just read my whole text, didn't I? Because it says... For I, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scripture. All right. All right. I tend to lose my place, so you may want to have to drag me back. Oh, we're doing the first day. Our fellowship because of the gospel should bring us joy. When you've got a church, Dad, you got something for me? No? Okay. It's okay to stop me. You can talk to this preacher. Okay? So anyway, let me get to, get to this one. Our fellowship because of the gospel should bring us joy. What holds us together in fellowship is all about Jesus. And if you've got joy in Jesus, you don't have a bit of trouble communicating with each other. You don't have a bit of trouble getting along with each other. You know where I'm going, don't you? If there's dissension in the house, there's somebody out of fellowship with Jesus. And they're going to be out of fellowship with you. And if there's a problem in the church and there's a someone who doesn't think the way the majority in the church thinks, guess what? They're out of fellowship with you and the Lord. Let me tell you an old story. I shouldn't do this, but I will. Little well, there was a church in California years ago. This is an old story. And the uh, pastor gave an invitation. This fellow came down from got gloriously saved. While he was down there, he told the preacher, preacher, what we need to do is we just need to 
make this place bigger so we can get more people in here. We just we just need to go out there and build us a big church so we can get more people saved just like I just got saved. Want to do it right now. Brand new Christian. Tell them. And the preacher's problem was he didn't know how to tell this new convert that it don't work like that. That you can't just come down and get saved and tell this congregation that you've got to expand, you've got to go out and reach the lost, you've got to raise the roof, and you've got to put a bigger building underneath it. So he didn't bother to explain that to this new Christian that God couldn't do what God would, would do if he wanted him to do it. So he said, okay. So he told him. Nobody wanted to tell him it don't work like that. So they did it. Great big church came out of it. Just because nobody had the heart to tell the newborn Christian that you just can't decide that God wants to grow people and the churches by winning the lost. And that in order to do that, you build a building. And what will they do? They'll come. It's interesting, isn't it? I just thought I'd throw that was free. All right, in like-mindedness. Paul hits this really hard in most of his writings. He's going to say it one way or another. But he's going to say, the church gets along. It gets along by agreeing with each other. And that includes, I think, as you know, the cliche of agreeing to disagree. Sometimes we can't get together on some issues. But we should always be together on certain issues. And those are the issues that are indisputable, and that's all the ones about Jesus Christ. Now, I've been involved in several uh, pastor organizations of different denominations. And we fellowship together based on our relationship with Jesus Christ. Even though our denominational differences are wide. But there's one thing we all could agree upon, and that was the text I just read to you, that Christ died for us, was buried, was resurrected, is at the right hand of God, ever interceding. You see, there's, there's that core belief. If they do not have that one, you cannot fellowship with them. It just don't work. While I'm there, I'll give you another quick free one. I may not get through three, chapter, three verses tonight, will In fact, I sat in Roundup, Montana in a preacher's meeting. And it was one a little usual long table thing and there's preachers all around it. And Father Fitzpatrick from the Catholic Church was sitting on the end here and I was right over here on the left hand side and, and the other guys were all around there, the Assembly of God and a couple of other Methodists and the, the American Baptist Church preacher and what have you. And I had just got to town, I was the new guy and they were trying to welcome me and make me feel at home and I thought well I don't know about this and of course I had no church, I just had about five people and they wanted a church. And I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I feel like I got a sneeze. You ever feel like you got a sneeze? What happens? You're probably going to sneeze. And I let go of this thing and I, and it was, you could have heard it down the block over at the Busy Bee Cafe where they sell these great big old, what do they call them? Cinnamon buns. They're about that tall, about that big around. Oh, to die for. They were wonderful. I'll tell you that story someday, too. I sneezed. Let it go big time. And Father Fitzpatrick looks over at me and says, Bless you, my son. I knew right away I was going to be all right in that town. 
I just had the blessings of the, of the local Catholic priest so that I couldn't do, you know, the good Lord was going to take care of me. I had it all covered. Uh, okay, I'm going to quit. Let me do from the first day. You want to see that, don't you? Believers start fellowshipping the moment that they're born again. And they can continue in this fellowship, enjoy with other believers, until Jesus comes. Now that's Bible. I just read it to you. It said, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. When you were born again was your first day in the kingdom of God. Amen. It has not ended. It will not end if you're truly born again. And so Paul had to say to these new Christians that he had one to the Lord, that there was a first day in their life of fellowship with God. That same day was a day of fellowship with the believers, any of them, anywhere. And he had to point out to them until now. Well, and tomorrow it will be now and tomorrow. And, you know, the idea is, is that if you have a fellowship with the Lord, you should be able to have a fellowship with your fellow man. Makes sense. Well, let me let me chase another rabbit. If you can't get along with each other in here, the problem exists that eventually you will be out there. I've watched people come in, get gloriously saved, supposedly. Be a front row Baptist. Somewhere along the line, they become a middle row Baptist. Somewhere a little further out the way, they're a backseat Baptist. And pretty soon they're an out street Baptist. And we say, well, what happened to so-and-so? I don't know. I think they got their feelings hurt. Is that fellowship? What, what is it all about? It happens all the time. Not here, I haven't noticed it, but it does occur. Maybe you have. Yeah. But the point is, is that we ought to be able to fellowship one with another just simply because of who we belong to. All right, so the first day. They can continue to fellowship and join with other believers till when? Till Jesus comes. The relationships which they have established with believers will foster fellowship in Christ. Now, how many of you last week that were had your book actually looked at this stuff and tried to do something with it? This one happens to say, what does being a servant mean to you? As a saint, do you feel holy or set apart? See, I could have a wonderful time just standing around talking with you all about this. And I thought about, well, what can we do someday? It wouldn't it be cool if we could just sit in the fellowship hall around tables and, and talk to each other about these ideas? Grace and peace in some commentaries is salutation. In its use here, is it more than a greeting? Huh? What do you think? Yes, it is. It's more than a greeting. Paul was serious about grace and peace. It wasn't, oh, hello, how are you doing? For Paul, when he said grace and peace, he knew where it came from. He knew it was heavenly bound and it was going to get you. And on and on. Paul said, give thanks always for all things. How can one do that? See it? Good stuff? Work on it. And then there's the personal use. Pray to know God's grace and peace through Jesus Christ more fully. Ask God for joy as you remember the fellowship which you have had with other believers. Some of you look back on some of your other churches that you've attended, and you think about some people in there, and you think about the joy that you used to have with those folks. Remember those days? Isn't that cool, huh? Shall I move on? Let's do it. Session, chapter 1, Session 2. In Christ Jesus. Oh, we're going to get to some Greek. Y'all like Greek? All right. One can know, the focus, you with me on the focus? One can know in our experience in their hearts the joy of being filled with Christ's righteousness. Y'all can be 
filled with Christ's righteousness. Most of you are. We need to fill up every day sometimes, people. Just, just, in fact, the Bible tells us to do that. All right, so let's do uh, verse 6. Being confident. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. I'm going to have to work on this. I'm going to go into some deep water just for those of you who like to swim. Okay? But let me go and break this down as we go. And for those of you who I may happen to, or you think I'm going over your head, I'm not doing it on purpose. What, what has to happen in a congregation such as this is that you have to feed everybody and some people are more hungry than others. Is that a bad, good way to explain it? All right, let me try to do it. Um, the word confidence here. Now let's look at become first. See that simple little word? Being confident of this, that he who began, the word become, and it is in our Kamaya, it occurs in the New Testament two times. Here, and in Galatians 3.3. 3. In Galatians 3.3 3, it says, Are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? All right, Paul used it in the book of Galatians, and he used it here in this book of Philippians. Only two times did he use that. Paul's confidence in Christ was unshakable. He trusted the Lord with all of his heart. Preacher hit some of this stuff this morning. How many of you can recite Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Trust in All right. Some of you are doing all right. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path and make it straight, as the preacher said this morning. Um, John said we can be confident. 1 John 5.14 This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Pretty cool. According to his will. This is the confidence. Who? What? According to his will. Yes. By our will. Oh, will. yeah. 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 We, uh, sometimes our will's more need than, than anything else, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see. I got, I got to keep on going because I want you to have all this stuff. All right. Confidence to finish. Confident is the word pepothea. I have persuaded myself is the translation. So when you say, when Paul said, I am confident, what he actually said in the Greek was, I have persuaded myself that. I don't know how else you can explain it to you. Tell me what confident means. Are you positive? Are you confident of what about what you're saying? If you have experienced it. Yeah, you know. I, I have persuaded myself that I'm right. And, and so that's the essence of that confidence. So oftentimes we, by not being able to really see the word that Paul really meant to say, really miss something. But when we have these translations, that's why these Greek and Hebrew scholars are so into their translations. Because a word is a picture. And if you say the word, 
To some people, they get a different picture than others. And so when Paul used this word confident to speak to his folks, the church at Philippi, which you all know wasn't a church, it was, it was we'll meet over under the tree next week. Uh, oh, can we come to your house? Yeah. And, and so oftentimes we think of, oh, this great big congregation that got together and they did their stuff. What we really have is a ragtag bunch of folks and they would come together wherever they could and then they would fellowship together. Yes, Ed? The church is not the building, it's the people. That's it. And, and that's the difference between the word church and ecclesia. If you're the ecclesia, you're called out. You're the people. And so when, when, when Justin uses the term church to you, he's talking about you folks, not the edifice. And, and I think it's an excellent word to be used. Paul was confident that Christ could finish what he started. We should be confident that Christ will perform a complete good work in us. And then, of course, we all know that Christ is the author and finisher of what? Our faith. Our faith. Confidence in Christ. Christ is doing the good work. Who's doing the good work? Christ. We're not called to do any good work. We're called to join Him in what He's doing. Henry Blackaby made a million bucks off of that one. Remember Henry Blackaby? Yeah. He wrote those books on, on the seven things that you need to do to make, and it transformed churches. It actually changed lives. It grew churches. Same thing happened with, with Rick Warren and his stuff on, on uh, what's the thing about church, something or another. You know who I'm talking about? Yes, that stuff. It's so good because it's Christ-centered that it actually does what God wants it to do. Okay, Christ is... Let me do the good work thing. And you've heard it before because James is... is, is some of you are studying James, but good works are the results of salvation. Good works are the results of salvation. What evidence do you have that you're saved? I do good works. Good works do not result in salvation. Is that right? You're all with me, aren't you? Because you guys believe this the same as I do. Good works doesn't save you. Being saved produces good works. You can't get the cart before the horse. It just don't work. So, we're, uh, number two, we can, be, we can have confidence that we will be changed to be like Him. And that's the confidence that, that Paul's talking, being confident that the good works will come, will be carried out in you, the completion of the middle of the day. And um, Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. Ephesians 2.10 is where I'm at. I'm under C. Let's see if I can find it here. Probably already up there on the screen. Ephesians 2.10 For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's break that down as long as we're here. We are not our own. See it? We're His. We're God's workmanship. How are we created? See it? In Him. Christ Jesus. Why are we created? See it? To do good works. Why? Because God prepared in advance for us to do it. See it? That's why I like to study the Word. Because it's so plain. It's right there. If you ask the questions of what's going on, it just flows. Unbelievable. Alright. Confidence includes becoming a new creature. We have to be in that completion process. And, and that is uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, 
If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. I'll be happy when that happens. I'm getting older and older. I'm looking for new. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to have to wind up with this. I'm just hitting the high spots. Maybe someday we can do a study on this. Maybe we can look at it more, but let me tell you. The word completion here that is being used is basically the word um, it kind of hangs on that day of Christ. You see the phrase completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The completion is the end of the age. This is the deep stuff. So I'm not going to like I say, we can maybe do some big studies some, in a little group or something. That's when Christ will come back the second time. You got it. The end of this age will be the completion. You will be being worked on until the end of the age. The day of Christ that is mentioned, you see it there? The day of Christ is the rapture. So when you're reading these words or wherever you find them, and you read something that says day of Christ, the day of Christ for most theologians is the rapture, the day when we called, when he calls us home. I want you to notice, you might want to write this down as well. The day of the Lord. You've heard that one. You'll find it in your Bible. You're going to find it here in Philippians. The day of the Lord is used 16 times in the Old Testament. Four times in the New Testament. And it is basically judgment, millennial age, cataclysmic disillusion of the universe. There is a Big Bang Theory. Y'all know that? They got it wrong. It's not on the front end. It happens on the back end. According to the Bible, I read this earth will be destroyed in a molten fire. The Big Bang. And so, somehow or another, they just they must have miscalculated a few million years. I don't know. You know. All right. Day of God. We've done day of Christ, day of the Lord, day of God. Day of God is the eternal state beyond time. Now for those of you who really want to get into this, Google or Bing it or whatever you do and see what everybody says out there about the days. And particularly look at the days of Christ, days of the Lord, day of God, that kind of stuff. Y'all got that for those of you who want to dig deeper? If you're looking for a particular person that's done something on it, it's Dr. John Phillips. And he has an excellent text on it. You'll just have to dig it out and find it. It's it's there somewhere. We can start this on verse 7 next Sunday evening. Did we cover some things? How many verses did I get? I got five, didn't I? More than I ever get. We'll probably not get through to the